Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Lunch and Learn here at Telus Science Museum. So glad to see you all here today. I'm David Dundee, Director of Education, and uh, I wanted to let you know about some exciting things coming up uh, here at the museum. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, Century Bank of Cartersville and Courtyard Marriott of, of, uh, Car of Cartersville for helping us uh, to support these programs. Um, coming up next on Ask the Expert, which will be next week um, on May the 4th. May the 4th be with you, yes. We have a, a Science of Star Wars uh, uh, program, and uh, that will be a virtual program you can tune into at home or in the office, and um, it'll be uh, actually our expert coming in is our very own astronomer, uh, Carissa Zadanke, and she'll be talking about the science of Star Wars, so please tune in for that. Um, also, uh, coming up, uh, our next Lunch and Learn, which will be on May 25th, uh, we have Carly Stepp. Uh, she is uh, uh, a state uh, conservationist and botanist, and she's going to be talking about Tennessee yellow-eyed grass, and you might wonder, why is she talking about that here at TELUS? Well, first of all, yellow-eyed grass is not a grass, it's a flower, just in case you wanted to know. And one of the few places it grows is right across the street from TELUS, and so we're going to hear a little bit about the story about this endangered plant that grows right next to your very favorite science museum. So please come in or tune in for uh, that program. And May is going to be just chock full of all sorts of cool astronomy uh, going on. Uh, so May the 7th, we have National Astronomy Day, all sorts of great activities and evening activities here at the museum. And then uh, moving on to uh, the 14th of May, uh, we are actually hosting an astronaut here at TELUS. And so Shane Kembro uh, will be here uh, that Saturday morning. Uh, so please look at our website for information about that. And then um, on the night of the 15th, morning of the 16th, we have scheduled, well, actually, he was scheduled elsewhere, but we are uh, going to be observing the total lunar eclipse uh, happening over Cartersville. And so you might want to come by and see that because it will be a beautiful event, I am sure. Well, today we have also a, a rather unusual program, uh, and we don't usually talk about archaeology here at the museum, uh, but this is going to be a very, very cool program, and the um, person who's giving it uh, uh, actually is one of our very own part-time educators that we're honored to have here on our staff, and, um, <clears throat> and uh, Katie is uh, going to be talking about uh, uh, her uh, archae uh, archae archaeological dig in Gotland, Sweden, and uh, I'm really excited about this. And uh, Katie Yeomans has been with us uh, a little over a year now, almost, almost a year. Okay, well, almost onto, onto our first year anniversary, and so she's. You'll see her on the floor teaching all shapes and sizes, and uh, also in the planetarium and the observatory, and we're just really pleased to have her as part of our, our team. And I'm really excited about hearing about the archaeology in Sweden. So without any further ado, I give you our speaker for today, uh, Katie Yeomans. Uh, hi, guys. Like he said, my name is Katie, and I've had the privilege of working on this island for two years. The first time I went was in 2014, and the second year I went back, uh, 2015, I got to go back as one of the uh, dig supervisors. So I got to see both sides of the work, which was a lot of fun. Um, so Gotland is situated right in the smack dab middle of the Baltic. It's between Denmark and Sweden, and it's controlled by Sweden. David, you took my notes. You took my notes. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it is an incredible island, and the sheep outnumber the people. 
And this is the coat of arms. Uh, sheep and ram are one of the main uh, economy supports. I can't think of that word. Anyways, they're really important to the island, and there is a ton of tourism. As uh, you can see where Gotland is right there, and what's pretty cool is the population uh, mostly lives within one city, which is Visby, and it gets around 750,000 visitors every year. It is where all the Swedes go to escape the heat of the mainland during the summer. So this is the island itself. Uh, that is the capital right there, Visby. It is a walled city, it's a medieval city, and it has been there since the early 1200s. I lived in Himsa while I worked, which is further down the island. It's a very small, very small rural community. It was fantastic. We got to stay at a local school. They're called folk schools, and it's for adults who are coming in to learn new programs. So that's where we stayed. And then my dig site was right there in an area called Vastrarn, and it just means the Western Garden, or the Western Land. And it was a, uh, it's a site called Pavikin, and it is a harbor site and what's the big deal about a harbor site? Well, being at the island and where it's located, Gotland is actually one of the big main stops. Oh, golly, there we go. Uh, for all the ships that were trading through the Baltic. So if you were coming into the Baltic, Gotland is where you stopped. If you're coming out of the Baltic, Gotland is where you stopped. And as a result, the people who lived on Gotland were actually far, far wealthier than the people on the mainland. So if the average person on the mainland had two goats and a piece of silver, the average Gotlander had a herd of goats and more silver than they knew what to do with, which I'll talk about in a second. But I do just have some pictures of the island. Uh, so this is a picture of Visby that I took. Um, it's one of my favorites. This is out in the garden. And this is the eastern wall, and it is still standing. It has, like I said, been there since the 1200s. And the people who live there still use the old chambers that were built into the wall. They are supported by beams and other things like that now, but the island itself is kept very intact. The entire island is actually a nature preserve. This is a Viking burial. You'll find them dotted throughout the landscape, and they are always done in the shape of boats like this. Some are big, some are small, some hold three or four people, some hold a family, some hold one person. It depended on their rank. And so one of the things we look for is these burials, because it helps us know, okay, there was settlement here, there were people here, this was an important enough place to bury people. That said, we do not excavate within those. They are part of um, the protected part of the island. And this is my view every morning at my dig site. Um, every morning we had to chase the sheep off which is a lot scarier than it sounds. And uh, so it was a harbor site, and this actually used to be all the way up to the ocean. The land receding, or I'm sorry, the water receding, we now have more of like a little inland sea. So what's the big deal? Like I said, Gotland was one of the last stops and one of the first stops. There, uh, we have found more Roman coins that were thought to be in circulation. We have found silk from China. We have found lace from England. We have found artifacts from India. Basically, if it went through the trade routes, it wound up on Gotland. And this map is actually one of my, uh, the gentleman I worked for's maps, and he does this really cool thing where he takes modern maps and then takes the old maps and layers them to figure out where the old houses were, where the old towns were, where these important things were located. And then you can also see all of the trade routes and how everybody stopped in Gotland. You also, if you go up here to Burka, which is one of our big Swedish cities, and there's a ton of burials, you will find just massive amounts of material from Gotland. It was a huge production site as well. And just a really brief history. This, this is Valdemar Otterdog, and he is kind of the villain of Gotland still to this day, and he invaded in 1361, and he held Visby hostage until they were able to fill three massive beer kegs with silver and gold. And if they didn't, he was gonna burn it down. It's called fire taxation. But uh, when he first invaded, the people of Visby who were living inside the walls shut the doors and didn't let the farmers and the peasants in, and they were slaughtered. 
So to this day, there is a rivalry between people that live within the walls and live outside of the walls. It's, uh, you know, it's not like it used to be, but there's still a lot of side eye and yeah, you live in the walls, I see how it is. So it's still a very big deal on the island to this day. One of the things Scotland is, oops, go back, is most famous for is its picture stones. Uh, picture stones tell us stories of battles and monsters and ideas people have. So this one is just a plain decoration. You see here, um, we've got some warriors fighting a beast. We're not quite sure what it is, we think it's a deer. This is a memorial stone. This is telling a story of a raid that the Vikings went on. This is another memorial stone. Here we have a, like a, I wouldn't call it decorative, but it's kind of like a way marker and it tells you kind of the history of the area. And this one that's so broken is also a memorial stone. But my favorite is this one right here. It's one of the only ones that have been found red and it's one of the only picture stones that depicts a woman. And we know that this woman is a shaman. A shaman is a priestess or a priest for uh, this certain type of religion. And we know this because we see her holding two snakes, which is a very powerful symbol. And then overhead, she has a knot of snakes, which is again, showing her power and her connection to the island itself and uh, the gods, basically. So this is a very fascinating find because one, you rarely find any depictions of women and then to find one that's this well-preserved, pretty incredible. So hordes, hordes are also a really big deal on the island. Um, like I said, the average Gotlander had so much wealth that instead of putting up fences, they would actually stamp their names in silver and bury it along their property lines. Because if somebody came in and said, oh, no, 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 this is my property, they could dig that silver up and say, my name's here, this is clearly my property. And it was a drop in the bucket to them. That's how much wealth they had. Um, this top, ooh, golly, sorry. This top picture, and actually all of these pictures, are part of something called the spilling hoard. And the spilling hoard was found in a uh, farm it had over, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the most famous. There was 144 pounds of silver and bronze recovered for it. 1,000 to at least 1,200 Persian coins that were freshly, at the time they would have been a new minted resource telling us there was active trade with Persia at the time. Uh, there were a lot of Islamic figures and coins as well and a ton of jewelry. So there, so far on Gotland, there have been over 700 silver hoards found. And as a result of this, metal detectors are banned on the island. But for some of our work, we need the metal detectors. So you have to get a special permit from the Gotland government and from the mainland. Even with that permit, we had the police called on us four times in three days because the Gotlanders take it very seriously about protecting their land and protecting their heritage. So what I think is particularly cool is we have our bird figure here with the chain around his feet. Birds are a really common um, motif in Viking art. We have our ravens, which symbolize Odin. We have our eagles, which also are Odin and power and strength. Um, one of my favorite standing stones, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, says uh, Olaf died giving food to the eagles, which means he died killing his enemies. So, the symbolism of the eagle and the bird is just incredibly important to everything that's going on on the island. Uh, another interesting thing is a lot of our hordes are found in rabbit dens. We don't know why the rabbits like to build the dens around the hordes, but a lot of them really have been found right there in those dens. And so when you go into the Gotland Museum, you'll often find a stuffed rabbit in a case, and that was usually the rabbit that had that hoard which I think is kind of cool. Ah, so 2014, Pavikin. This is my first year out there. I was just one of your average grunts. You can see us on our first day of our dig up there, Trench Nine. 
I would have showed a picture of our last day, but we looked like mud people. Like, there was no telling we were people. It was rough. Um, so what was really cool in here, this is actually the gentleman I worked for, Dan Carlson. And we were, like I said, we were doing the metal detecting. Uh, so this site had originally started to be excavated in the 50s. And the documentation was poor, and the record keeping was poor, and nothing was really done to today's standards. So we started uh, six more pits. I was in trench nine. We also had a test burial trench, which did not have anything in it. But as you can see, we dig down, we go all the way down to the bedstone, or sorry, the bedrock. And one of the reasons we don't haul all of these rocks out is we have to take measurements of them. Everything we find, including the rocks, we have to take one of our meter sticks and a total station and measure how tall they are, where they are, and where they are in re relation to other stones. Because we're looking for foundations, we're looking for um, burials potentially, but we, we don't move the big stones unless we just have to. If there's something under it, that's too bad, unfortunately. But most of these stones do sit on bedrock, so. Uh, we also did a lot of lab work. Uh, part of the field school is after you dig, you have to process. There is no, oh, hey, fun. There's, there's not a lot of whips in archaeology. There's not a lot of fedoras. It's a lot of dirt and lab work. And you will spend a lot of time just processing those finds and cleaning them and taking measurements of every tiny detail. So these are some of my favorite finds that we found in 2014. Uh, number one, it's part, oh, did I do something? Oh, I went too far, go back, sorry. Um, so number one is part of a, it's a silver brooch, and it's part of a brooch called a fish brooch. And the reason it's called that is you see the scale pattern. They'd be done these really intricate patterns that were meant to mimic fish scales. Uh, number two is part of a needle whetstone. So that's how they would sharpen their needles to keep them going. It could also been used potentially for fishing hooks, or any small iron instruments. And iron is my passion. A lot of people are, you know, about the gold and the silver and the jewels. I like iron. Iron is what every person has to use, from kings to peasants. Everybody has iron. And I think that's a really cool uh, overarching connection between all the ranks of people. Uh, number three is a blue bead with a smaller red and white striped pattern. We think it might have been representing an eye. We do know the glass for the bead came from uh, Rome. And we, had a, we have a lot of Roman glass on the island, and the Vikings would often repurpose this glass, melt it down, and make their own jewelry from it. Number three, oh no, I just did number three, sorry. Number four is a piece of iron chain mail. And we do believe that uh, down inside of some of the crust that we were cleaning out, that some of the rust is actually blood. So that's a pretty cool find. I get really excited about it. Um, and then for number five, we have a brass buckle. And we think it might have been uh, used for uh, horse tack and horse gear. Because the, there are a wild population of horses on Gotland. They're very small, they're very stocky, and we have found tack for them. Number six is just an iron hook. Um, it could have been used for really anything, hanging stuff to dry it. We, we don't know a real purpose for it just yet. And then down at the bottom, number seven, that is a lead and gold bead. And uh, it would have been used by somebody who was of a higher rank to have that much gold in it, which is, again, fairly interesting. Ah, so this is, this is my favorite. This is the chape. Um, so a chape goes at the end of a sword sheath, so the sword does not come through and stab you in the leg. They're pretty important. Uh, this one, first we found what I call the feet. And the feet were found right there next to a rock. And we found them actually in two separate buckets. So when you get a bucket of soil, you go over to a sifter, you sift it all out and you pick things out. Your bones, your artifacts, anything you find. And then uh, the next day actually, we were down here in this square and we found the body of the shape. And at first we didn't connect the two until we were, a friend and I were sitting around in a lab playing with things, and we went, oh, hey, these, these fit together. And it, it, was, it was a really fun, aha, moment. It's uh, one of those things you want to look for in the dig. It excites you. And so we realized it all fit together, and then we looked at how the fact that it is shaped with that hooked beak. It's like an eagle. 
And I mentioned that standing stone of, eagle, of Olaf dying feeding the eagles. We are really close to that site. Pavikin would have been a town that people passed through to go to that standing stone. And the amount of eagle things we have found almost seems like it's a gift shop. Like, I know, not quite a gift shop, but we do find a lot of eagle memorabilia or um, artifacts in this area. And when we got it all cleaned up, it looked like this. And it was found in Trench 9. And I'm going to talk a little more about Trench 9 and the things we found there and what it tells us. But you can see how the feet attach. And again, our hooked beak, you can see the eye. And so it's an eagle in flight, which is pretty cool. So the hard data. Um, when we look at it, I, this is a study I did compared to Trench 8. Uh, in trench eight, we have something called, we have mass material and we have single finds. Mass material is the bones, the charcoal, the slag, the stuff you just find tons and tons of, where our single finds are things like our chape, the iron hook, the beads. So when we look at mass material for trench nine, which is our purple one, you can see we have a ton of slag, a ton of burnt bone, and unburnt bone, and nails and rivets. But then when you go over to trench eight, you have a lot more single finds and not nearly so much garbage, as it were. And what we think this means is that uh, Trench 9 was likely a dumping ground of a workshop. We found broken things there. And we also think this because to make their fires burn hotter, they would put bone into their kilns, into their fires. So all this burnt bone we found tells us that there was people working here. And slag, oh, so much slag. Slag is when you're working with iron and like that scummy stuff floats to the top. Like you know when you're making a soup and like the fat layer floats to the top, you scoop it off. That's what slag is. Slag is basically useless iron. I love it. Um, so this tells us that there was this was a dumping ground, and we call these middens. And middens are vital to archaeology. You will not believe the things people throw away. If you ever want to be a creeper. Go steal your neighbor's garbage, look through it, and you'll learn a lot about them, what their eating habits are, uh, what's important to them, what's not important to them. So midden piles tell us who these people were and what was important to their society. So then we get to the summer of 2015, and um, this was a very different experience than 2014. It really showed me the other side of the work when I came back as one of the dig leaders. And it was also kind of, I'm not going to lie, a disappointing year. We didn't really find anything. Uh, this is our, the knot burial that we actually spent three weeks excavating and found nothing. And it was meant to be a burial. And we know for, like, all the documentation we had, there's other burials in the area. There should have been a body here. So it was a really frustrating experience to spend all of this time and all of this energy to find nothing. Uh, this is a trench that we took all the way down to sterile soil right here. And in that whole trench, we found one piece of worked stone. And again, that's about three weeks of work right there. So it was a really interesting experience from the first year where we just had tons and tons of things coming in and comparing it to that second year. And it, it almost makes you feel like a failure. Like, obviously, it's not your fault. You know, there's not things there. But it's so frustrating and it is really detrimental to like the morale of the whole crew. So archaeology is not always adventure and finding things and having a great time. A lot of it is hard work with little payoff. But the fact that we don't find anything also tells us things that people weren't habiting here. This was not an important area to people. This was not part of the um, harbor that anybody cared about. This is what it looked like when we started, this nice grassy field. This is what it looked like when we finished. Um, you can see some folks working in the trenches and uh, sorting the finds. One of the things we do at the end of the day or on rainy days is when we're in the field, we will sit in the tents and clean artifacts. Not just in the lab, but we clean, we process, we weigh, because everything has to go in very particular bags and keep very careful labeling. We do things in layers. Uh, it's called uh, stratigraphy. And so our top layer is always going to be our youngest. And our bottom layer is always going to be the oldest. So it's really important for us to know what layer it came from. What deposit did it come from? What, 
you know, and well, mm, excuse me, <clears throat> lost my train of thought. And what's also a little frustrating is some of this land has been plowed, so we get mix over. And when we go to these plowed lands, we know we're not gonna have as much context. And context is vitally important for, again, knowing what something is, knowing its age, knowing its importance. If you don't have context, you don't have any information. Uh, so these are some of our 2015 finds. This is really kind of most of it. Uh, so this is a iron knife. Number one is an iron knife that I spent far too much time trying to reconstruct. Um, it became almost like a uh, obsession for me. It was my white whale. Number two is a Roman coin. And we still aren't sure which emperor is imprinted on it. Uh, the guess is one of the Caesars, but there's a lot of them. Then we have number three, which is an iron ring. We also think that might have been from horse tack. We get down to number four, and it's a square orange bead with a blue and white pattern in it. And I apologize for the quality of some of the photos. It was 2015, and my phone was not what it is today. Uh, then we get down to number five, and this was a mold for making needles or fishing hooks, because then you could curl it. But you would take your molten iron and pour it in there and let it cool, and then shave down what you needed. So, and on the other side of it, there was a whetstone for sharpening, which is pretty, pretty interesting, I think. And then we get over to number six, and it's an iron pin decoration. We're not sure if it would have been used to hold somebody's um, cloak together, their dress together, but we know it was some ornamentation for the body. We're just not sure who. Um, and then we get to the big find of 2015, which is our brooch. Um, so the brooch is made out of, all of this is gold, and the rest of it is brass, and it had garnets and set in it at one point. And we also found uh, cloth attached to the back of it. 900 year old cloth, and it was still intact to the back of our brooch. But the sad thing is, we can't use our brooch. It was found using a metal detector, and um, one of the students took it out of the ground before we got any measurements or anything, and went running off with it to show everybody what he found. So we lost all of our context for it. We weren't able to measure it, we weren't able to set up a parameter and do some excavating. It was, it was heartbreaking. Um, but that's one of the big lessons, is you have to take your time, you have to go slow. This isn't a fast, adventurous job, like it seems like. It's labor intensive, but if you love it, it's a labor of love. Um, so the brooch is very cool, it is cleaned up. It is still in the care of the gentleman I work for because the museum doesn't want it. There's no context for it. Sorry, the, the brooch, you know, seven years later and it still breaks my heart. Um, and then we get into how do you know where to dig? So we use a program called GIS and we can take data points and make our map. And these are two that I put together. Um, the circle is just to show you where, the circle shows you where we were digging in 2015. Um, you see that longer trench? We were going off the sides of it. The trench there was also a dig from the 50s. Um, what, what you're looking at here is phosphorus sampling. So what we do is we go out with this giant T-shaped, um, it's a giant T-shaped piece of metal, <laughs> sorry. and you punch it into the ground, and when you take the sample out of the soil, then you can check for the phosphorus levels. And phosphorus usually means poop. And poop usually means humans, and uh, lots of animals together. So you can see we focused on where the mass, where the, the bright white spots are where we have more phosphorus. And you can tell as we get closer and closer in where the lines of the settlement would have been. And then our contour mapping um, you very literally go out with a total station. Have you guys ever seen those things on the side of the road where the guys are looking through it and there's somebody on the far side holding a staff? That's how they take measurements. That's how we do height measurements of things and also data location points. So uh, one of my coworkers and I, we went out and we took all of these location points and all this data and measured how high each one of those little rocks was, how high each little hill was and put the data points in to give us a contour map that we can then overlay also with our phosphorus map and see, like for example, the big hills and things, what we measured, those don't have a lot of phosphorus in them. There would have been no point to move these giant rocks 
or to be on top of these rocks. So the village was literally built around the natural area. So it's a very cool thing to be able to layer these maps. Oh, I guess I am done. Okay, I, that went faster than I thought. Goodness. Um, oh, <laughs> I thought I had a lot more material. Well, <laughs> sorry. How about some questions from please, the from the audience questions. about our archaeological dig? <laughs> I I think I have a question right here. <laughs> Question number one, Miss Katie. Yes, Where Ms. does all this stuff go once you find it? So there is a museum on the island, um, and it is literally called the Gotland Museum. And a lot of the artifacts are stored there. But we're also practicing what we call eco-archaeology, where, like, for example, when we find um, human remains, we take our measurements, we measure what they're buried with, and then we put them back because in our museums there are just boxes and boxes of stuff sitting. And what's the point of having all this stuff in the museum if you're not gonna put it on display? So we put it back where it belongs, which gives a chance for future archeologists to find it, and it also just respects the people and the items and the people that came before us. All right, I got a question way in the front here. Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm gonna bring, hang on, hang on. I'm hang gonna on. bring my microphone to our audience. If you found the artifacts, why couldn't you bring them home either for you or for a museum here in the United States? Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, so the artifacts are the property of the government. For example, when I worked in Belize, if we found any human remains, we had to stop what we were doing, call the government and have them come out and put up a quarter. And you would have to, you could not stop excavating until you had all of it out. So you could be out in the jungle at four in the morning. Um, with this, again, it, it's the property of the island, the property of the Swedish government. For laws in Georgia, though, anything you find on your property belongs to you. It's kind of a finder's keepers thing. So uh, if you go dig around in your yard, anything you find is yours to keep. You don't have to turn it over to the government. Uh, unless they're human remains. Well, you know, actually, actually, that is a very interesting point. Um, over in Kennesaw, in the Kennesaw Mountain area at Pigeon Hill, there is a gentleman who has Native American remains in his basement that he found on his property and refuses to hand over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> Let me come over here. This, this gentleman here has a question. Regarding eco um, archaeology, yeah. whenever you're putting back the um, specimens that you found, mm -hmm. do you try to put them back as you found them, or do you try to arrange them, like you said, with the knife to try and provide a clearer image to uh, future no, archaeologists? No, we, we put them back as we found them. Um, the knife came out from sifting. I just found a bunch of little iron chunks and suddenly went, oh, it's a puzzle. So it took me a long time. But when we returned the burials and the burial artifacts, we always put them back as we found them. Because again, that provides context for the future archeologists. And again, it's showing respect to those who came before us. So the artifacts you put back though, like iron, they'll continue to deteriorate mm -hmm, that's in true. the soil. So in a sense, it's a, so we take disservice our to future archaeologists because it, it it it'll a extent, eventually disappear into dust. Which is unfortunate, but again, the museum on Gotland has so much stuff, and the mainland doesn't want any of our stuff because they have so much of the Gotland stuff too, that instead of just putting it in storage, we take all of our measurements, we take photos, we do sketches, we do everything we can, and then we put it back instead of letting it sit in a storage warehouse. <coughs> That's kind of a two-part question. Oh, uh, so the gentleman that you were working for. Yes, ma'am. What, what exactly is he doing? Like, uh, okay, so his name is Don Carlson, and he is actually the head archaeologist of Gotland. He has the only archaeology company that's allowed to work on Gotland. And his passion is maps. So really, he takes old maps and modern maps and overlays them. So he can say, you know what, there was a church here. Or, or you know what, this road used to do this. And it's one of the ways we also lay it over our phosphorus sampling and our contour mapping. So his thing is maps and how maps can inform us about who came before us. What's your second part? Uh, so as far as such as the brooch mm -hmm. where the procedure wasn't followed and no one is going to claim it, what is he, what is he gonna do with it? He will actually hand it over to the museums eventually. Right now, Right now, exactly. Right now, it is in, uh, it's the company's called Arcus, 
and it's in their storage facility, his storage facility, and he is trying to get it over to the government because it is a really incredible piece. Um, but so far, that poor piece is kind of stuck in limbo, which is it's really disappointing. Well, yeah, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, question in the back. So what happened to the student who uh, took the brooch and ran around with it? Um, well, we're not sure what happened to him, but he just didn't come back to the lab. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we had a long, long talk about procedure, and he got to watch um, some training videos in Swedish, which he did not speak, but he had to watch them. And he basically was not allowed to dig by himself anymore. He had a chaperone the whole time. And how did I know it was a him? <laughs> so could you have possibly used any dating methods to date? So we use radiocarbon dating, which I'm sorry, I love radiocarbon dating. Um, so that's what we can do with the charcoal, and that's exactly how old we know things are, because our charcoal holds data. So radiocarbon dating is looking at the half-life of carbon, because all living things have carbon in them. And we can tell by the decay of the carbon atoms how much, I'm sorry, the carbon, yeah, anyways. We can tell by the decay how much remains and how old something might be. That's how we know the fabric on the brooch was 900 years old. And that's how we know that our site was inhabited from the early 1300s to the mid uh, 1600s. And so there's two kinds of dating. There's relative dating and there's absolute dating. And our absolute dating is what we use with our uh, carbon and things like that, because it gives us an absolute date. And our relative dating is what I mentioned with stratigraphy, where we can say the top layer is newer, the bottom layer is older. So it's either kind of a, yeah, yeah I guess it's this old, or you know what? I know how old this is. You mentioned that uh, uh, Visby in, in Gotland has a lot of uh, tourist traffic. Mm -hmm. Uh, how big a problem is it in Sweden for souvenir hunters uh, to go out in the countryside? Uh, so it was a problem, but the folks who live out in the countryside are so protective that, like I said, when we were just doing our, our metal detecting out there with a guy who was well known on the island, uh, we had the cops too far. Really? Sorry. Come on. Oh, I made it so mad. <laughs> OK, well, so anyways, uh, the gentleman who was out there with the metal detecting, we had the police called on this four times. There is absolutely no tolerance for treasure hunters. Um, you will be asked to leave the island. You will be banned from the island, because it is so important to preserve the natural state of the place. Plus, when you go out in the fields, you really upset the sheep. And I don't know if you guys have ever been chased by a ram. Not a good time. Not a good time. So yeah, treasure hunters are strongly encouraged to never come back to the island. Another question right up here. Uh, at the time, were you able to use some of the more modern techniques, LIDAR or ground penetrating radar? So yeah, we actually did use some LIDAR out there to help us, um, not LIDAR, I'm sorry, the ground penetrating radar. Pretty cool. It looks like a lawnmower, but instead of a lawnmower, it's got a box on it, and it sends these signals down into the ground, and it bounces it back to us, and it can tell us the shapes of the rocks underneath, if there's human remains, if there's anything that's interesting, because it'll bounce back with like a different frequency or a different shade, basically. Um, we did not use LIDAR. LIDAR is really good for penetrating through the jungle, like if we were down in Belize looking for our temples, it can go through the uh, canopy and the foliage really well, but when you're on the ground doing it, ground penetrating radar is the way to do it. You guys know at the beginning of Jurassic Park, the first movie, and they have that big machine, and it goes boom, and sends back all the results for the raptor? That was an early form of ground penetrating radar. Uh, now we're a little more gentle with it. But it really does look like pushing a lawnmower around out in the field. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Let's give her a big round of applause. Yay! <laughs> Thank you.
We have some evaluation forms on the table. If you'd just give us some input about uh, our talk today or suggestions for future talks, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here today.